you will hear a conversation between a woman and a policeman. First, you have some time to look at questions one to five. Now listen carefully and answer questions one to five. Hello, Sergeant Rhodes speaking. Can I help you? Yes. Hello. I'd like to report a stolen bag. Hmm. Okay, a stolen bag.、Uh, we've been getting a lot of these lately. I'll need to get some details.、Uh, let's see.、Uh, when was the last time you had your bag? Well,、uh, about two hours ago. I just can't believe this has happened. I take it everywhere with me. It was given to me as a graduation present. I'm just so upset. Yes, I know.、Uh, it's very frustrating. It seems like I put it down for a second, and then it was gone. Yes. Look, the good news is that most of the stolen bags in our area are found, usually without the money. So I'd be surprised if you don't get it back later. Tell me, what does the bag look like? Well, it's dark blue, cylindrical. It has two carry handles either side of a zipper on top.、Um, the zipper actually runs the length of the bag. It's a Vitoli bag. Okay. Are there any other identifying marks on the bag? Things that would be unique to it.、Um, name tags. Scuff marks, that kind of thing. Well, not really.、Um, there are a couple of scratches in the top left corner on one side of the bag, near the handle, and I think another one in the opposite corner. Okay.、Uh, scratches on opposite corners. Now, where were you when the bag went missing? Well, I remember the time. It was a quarter past twelve. Oh no! Actually, it was a bit after that, more like twelve twenty-five, because I was supposed to meet one of my friends for lunch at twelve thirty. Anyway, I was standing outside the supermarket when all of a sudden a group of teenagers came walking past. They must have been heading towards the cinema. They seemed to be in a hurry and probably late for the movie, so I stepped aside to let them by. When they'd passed by, I reached down to pick up my bag, and it was gone. I see. Now, can you remember the contents of the bag? Yes.、Um, let's see. My passport and some traveler's checks. Fortunately, I was carrying my camera and I had my wallet in my pocket. They're the main valuable things.、Um, okay.、Uh, anything else at all? Hmm. Let's see. No, I think that was it. Oh, a few pens, but that's all really. As I say, nothing of real value. Okay. I'm going to have to get your details. Are you here on holiday? Yes, as a matter of fact, I am. I'm visiting from Canada. I've been here for three weeks already, but I'll be here for another month. Before you listen to the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions six to ten. Now listen and answer questions six to ten. Now,、uh, have you contacted your credit card company? Yes, I did that immediately. They were very helpful. I still can't believe this could happen to me, and while I'm supposed to be enjoying myself on holiday. Yes, it's a real disappointment whether you're on holiday or not. A thief strike when you least expect it. Anyway, I need to take down your particulars.、Uh, what's your name then? Yes,、uh, my name is Helen Reddy. That's R E A D Y. My address is well, the place where I'm staying here is the Palms, Unit Fourteen, Seventy Five Paradise Avenue. Okay, I may need your home address in Canada, but I'll get that more towards the time you're going to leave.、Uh, what about the telephone? What number will I be able to reach you on? Yes, it's four double five nine one double three two. Okay, four double five nine one. 
double three two. And how much do you think the bag and contents are worth? Well, it's not really a big cost, probably only a hundred dollars. It's the inconvenience of it all. I understand. Look, we have a lot of lost or stolen property recovered daily. Come by the station tomorrow and have a look. As I said, there's a high chance that we'll get the bag back. Your passport, at the very least. Okay. Thanks for your help. See you tomorrow then. Bye. Yes. Bye. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. You will hear a tour guide welcoming a group of visitors to the British Library, and telling them about the library and what they will see there. First, you have some time to look at questions eleven to fifteen. Now listen carefully and answer questions eleven to fifteen. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to your very own tour of the British Library on this lovely afternoon. My name is Tony Walters, and I'm your guide for today. Could I please see your tickets for the guided tour? I'd also like to remind you that any tickets bought today do not include a visit to the reading rooms. I'm afraid we don't do visits on Fridays or any weekday during working hours, so as not to disturb the readers. But if you do want to see those rooms, the only day there are tours is on Sundays. So, I don't want anyone to be disappointed about that today. Okay, thank you. Right, we'll start with a brief introduction. As many of you know, this is the United Kingdom's National Library. And you can see that this is a magnificent modern building. It was first designed by Sir Colin St John Wilson in 1977, and inaugurated by Her Majesty the Queen more than 20 years later in 1998. As you can see, the size is immense, and the basements alone have 300 kilometers of shelving, and that's enough to hold about 12 million books. The total floor space here is one hundred thousand square meters, and as I'll show you, the library houses a huge range of facilities and exhibition spaces, and it has a thousand staff members based here in the building. So you can appreciate the scale of our operation. In fact, this was the biggest publicly funded building constructed in the United Kingdom last century. It is still funded by the government as a national institution, of course, and it houses one of the most important collections in the world. The different items come from every continent and span almost three thousand years. The library isn't a public library, though. You can't just come in and join and borrow any of the books. Access to the collections is limited to those involved in carrying out research. So it's really a huge reference library for that purpose, and anyone who wants to consult any materials that are kept here can formally apply to use the library reading rooms. You now have some time to look at questions sixteen to twenty.
Now listen and answer questions 16 to 20. Right. Well, here we are, standing at the meeting point on the lower ground floor, just to the right of the main entrance. I've given you all a plan of the building so that we can orientate ourselves and get an idea of where we'll be going. Now, outside the main entrance, you'll see the wide piazza with the stunning sculpture of Newton. The sculptor was Paolozzi, but it's based on the famous image by William Blake, and it's definitely worth a closer look. On the other side of the piazza from the statue is the conference centre, which is used for all kinds of international conventions. We'll take a quick look inside at the end of our tour. Looking ahead of us now, you'll see that we're standing opposite the staircase down to the basement, where you'll find the cloakroom. And to the left of that, we have the information desk, where you can find out about any current exhibitions, uh, the times of the tours and anything you need to know if you don't have a tour guide. As you can see, on this lower ground floor, we also have a bookshop. That's the area over to the left of the main entrance. You'll be free to browse there when we get back to the ground floor. Now, opposite the main entrance on this floor, we have the open stairs leading up to the upper ground floor. And at the top of them, in the middle of the upper ground floor, you can see a kind of glass-sided tower that rises all the way up through the ceiling and up to the first floor. This is called the King's Library. It's really the heart of the building. It was built to house the collection that was presented to the nation in 1823 by the King. You can see it from every floor above ground. When we go up there, you'll find the library's treasures gallery on the left. Uh, can you find it on your plan? That's the exciting one, so we'll be visiting that first, but we'll also take a look at the stamp display situated behind it on the way to the cafe. Uh, a lot of people miss that. The cafeteria runs along the back of the floor, and in the right-hand corner you'll find the lifts and toilets. <laughs> Always good to locate them. The other main area on that floor is the public access catalogue section, and I'll show you how that operates when we get up there. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. You will hear part of a talk about attending a science festival. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. Now I think nearly all of you have received confirmation of your school placements for next term and as part of your activities we will be asking you to take responsibility for promoting a school visit to the Norchester Science Festival. Of course, the head of science at your school will be aware of the festival and should have all the details of it but all the heads of science at your schools will be looking to you to be the main organiser and motivator of a visit to the festival. They'll give you the documents you need. We hope that you will motivate pupils at your schools to take an interest in the festival. It runs for three days. There are day tickets and special three-day tickets, and schools have the extra option of a two-day ticket. 
We hope you will encourage your pupils to visit it on one or two days. But most important of all, we hope you will use the festival to generate a lively interest in science that will last all year round and provide the school with a lasting benefit. This will, with luck, lead to improved examination results in science subjects. And let's not forget, we hope your pupils will have a lot of fun too. Needless to say, your performance in achieving these aims will count towards your final exam grade at the end of the year. Now, let me just say a few words on why a science festival. Science is part of our everyday world in a way that is different now from before. Of course, we are used to having the benefit of scientific inventions. We are used to the aeroplane, the motor car, the space rocket and so on. But now we live in a truly scientific age, which means one where inventions and improvements are matters of routine rather than occasional and unusual events. We have become a really scientific society. Yet we find that we are failing to interest and enthuse the young in this. Fewer young people are choosing to study science at school after the age of 16 and even fewer at university. As a result, we have fewer teachers coming into schools to teach science. And many science teachers are not teaching their specialism. For example, I know of several cases where maths is being taught by biologists and chemistry is being taught by physicists. We urgently need another 3,000 science teachers in England at least. That's why we look to you, the science teachers who are starting off your careers, to inject enthusiasm and wonder into the study of science. And we hope the Norchester Festival will help you to do this. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. Now, enough of the background. What about the festival? There are three main venues where the festival events take place. These are the Millennium Library, the Town Hall, not the Town Hall itself, but the Town Hall Conference Centre, and the Norchester Theatre. Now, when you are planning your visits, Remember that many of the activities for younger pupils will be at the Millennium Library and the secondary school pupils may find more to interest them in the Conference Centre. Now, just so that you have some immediate information, I'd like to mention a few of the events that are taking place this year. One event of special interest to people living in this area is called Waterworld. This is a clay model of the southeast of England and the presenters show you the effects of rising sea levels as a result of climate change. They ask the audience to select the rise in sea level, for example, 20 or 40 or 60 centimetres, and the model shows the places that would be flooded as a result. Watch out for your town. Does it sink or does it swim? Transport 2050 is about transport options for our towns in the future. A number of experts will introduce the topic and then everyone at the event will have a chance to speak and give their views. Science in a Suitcase is a comedy act by two scientists who do crazy experiments and sing songs and play the clown to large audiences every afternoon. I'm particularly looking forward to that one, which should be entertaining. Ropes and Hangings is an interactive event which will be of interest to young people in which, after experimenting with ropes and bricks, they build a real suspension bridge. That kind of hands-on activity is always really popular. And, appealing to a different audience, 
There is paper and time, in which some experts will be showing us the techniques they use for the conservation of ancient books and manuscripts. This will obviously not be for everybody, but it should be interesting just to see how they do it. Now let's move on to tickets and transport to the festival. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You'll hear a lecture on MSG. First, you have some time to read questions thirty-two to forty-one. Now listen to the conversation and answer questions thirty-two to forty-one. You've probably noticed that MSG appears regularly among the ingredients of your favorite foods. But what is it? How long has it been used? How is it used? MSG or monosodium glutamate is a chemical commonly used to add flavor to salty or sour-tasting foods. The average person knows almost nothing about it, but today MSG is found in everything from potato chips to soup. Its principal component is an amino acid called glutamic acid or glutamate. It was identified by Professor Kikune Aikida in 1908. But Eastern cooks have been using glutamate-rich seaweed as flavoring for more than 1,200 years. Glutamate is found in two forms. Bound glutamate, which is linked to other amino acids forming a protein molecule, and free glutamate, that has no link to protein. Only free glutamate is effective in enhancing the flavor of food. Foods often used for their flavoring qualities, such as tomatoes and mushrooms, have high levels of naturally occurring free glutamate. MSG is usually produced through fermentation of corn, sugar beets, or sugar cane. The finished product is a pure white crystal, which dissolves easily and blends well in many foods. Monosodium glutamate enhances the basic flavor of many foods. New studies also show that MSG elicits a unique taste that is known as umami in Japan and often described by Americans as a savory, broth-like, or meaty taste. Umami may be the fifth basic taste, beyond salty, sweet, sour, and bitter. As an integral part of cuisines around the world, this savory taste is common to the bouillons of Europe, the oyster sauce of China, the soy and fish sauces of Southeast Asia, the pizza of Italy, and the chowders and stews of America. MSG helps bring out the best natural flavors in a variety of foods, such as meat. Poultry, seafood, and vegetables. While MSG harmonizes well with salty and sour tastes, it contributes little or nothing to sweet or bitter foods. Results of taste panel studies indicate that a level of 0.1 to 0.8 percent MSG by weight in food provides optimum enhancement of the food's natural flavor. This is within the range of glutamate that naturally occurs in foods. Approximately one half teaspoon of MSG is an effective amount to enhance the flavor of a pound of meat or four to six servings of vegetables or soup. MSG is a self-limiting substance. Once the proper amount is used, adding more contributes little to food flavor. Overuse of MSG, as with many other seasonings and spices, may cause some foods to have an undesirable taste. There is simply no substitute for wholesome, quality food and good cooking techniques.
MSG makes good quality food taste better, but will not improve the flavor of poor quality food. Disturbingly, scientists have known since the 1960s that MSG kills brain cells in young animals. Further research suggested that MSG may also be responsible for ailments ranging from skin rashes to irregular heartbeat and depression. Reports vary on just what percentage of the population is sensitive to MSG. One researcher put the figure as high as 30%, but food industry-sponsored studies have suggested it as low as 1 to 2%. Baby food manufacturers agreed to take MSG out of their products in the 1970s, but it is still widely used in other foods. This is because MSG is an economical way of stimulating great taste. If you're making a chicken stew but can't afford a whole chicken, why not use a little chicken and a lot of MSG? Consumer groups in the USA campaign regularly against its use, but for many of us, MSG will continue to be a part of everyday life. Food, it seems, will always be a matter of personal taste. Thanks for watching. Here are other two videos. You can watch them as well. And if you haven't yet subscribed my channel, please subscribe it and hit the bell icon for my upcoming videos and share these all videos among your friends.